Ok guys, we're here today with John Danner, a huge honor for me, Placido. Guys, we are just starting the new series from John Danner, the new wave of Jiu-Jitsu, which is the new philosophy of uh, position escapes. And uh, John, can you explain a little more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, over the years, I've gotten a huge number of requests for people to talk about uh, subsequent developments in the squad methodology of both training and the overall philosophy of, of, of jiu-jitsu. When the squad first broke out, it was mostly in submission-only tournaments in a different time frame when, when uh, pretty much if you knew anything about leg locks, you could get to a very high level and beat even very good people just because they didn't know a lot. Um, times have changed, you know, a decade has passed on and uh, since then the squad has moved uh, far beyond just smaller submission-only tournaments into uh, the forefront of world championship competition at ADCC and uh, now we have all kinds of different demands on us. It's no longer just about securing a submission, it's about positional pressure as well. So they have to be able to play a much wider ranging game. And as that evolution has occurred, people have said, okay, uh, could you reflect that in instructional videos? So I wanted to create a new instructional video in Nogi, which is called New Wave Jiu-Jitsu. And New Wave Jiu-Jitsu represents uh, the synthesis of the original submission systems and uh, allies this with the positional pressure which is required for victory in ADCC type tournaments. So it's kind of a, a merging of the positional game with submission systems as it's evolved over time. Um, I'm really looking forward to presenting this because it's quite radically different from some of the other stuff uh, that we've presented in the past. Now, um, what I wanted to do in the first video is to look in particular at the notion of escape. Now, you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute, didn't you cover uh, pin escapes back in uh, Go Further Faster? Well, that was in a gi and it was at a fundamental level. What I want to do now is to look at the unique philosophy uh, of the squad when it comes to escapes. We have a new way of looking at them, which is quite different from the way escapes are traditionally taught. Jiu-Jitsu by its very nature is a pretty conservative game. It's built around three approaches to position. There are dominant positions, there are neutral positions, and there are inferior positions. And the traditional approach of Jiu-Jitsu has always been if you're in a bad position, just work your way back to a neutral position. And from that neutral position, try to build on from there. So Jiu-Jitsu has always been uh, a fairly conservative sport where you find yourself in trouble, fight your way back to neutral position. And 99 times out of 100, that neutral position is guard position, okay? Mm -hmm. So if I had Placido on top of me in the mountain position, my goal in Jiu Jitsu 101 is to get back to guard position. And I can do that in two ways. Uh, I could go back to my own guard, like so, or, I could go into his guard. Like so, okay? And in either case, we ended up back in a neutral position, guard position, okay? So I started off in a dreadful situation, and I went back to neutrality either by putting him in my guard or me coming up into his guard. Either way, we ended up in a neutral position, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's a fine method of working, but we still use it occasionally. But I wanted to go beyond that and start looking at a new philosophy of escape where we took the, some of the traditional escapes. We also added some of the escapes which are very much associated with the squad, things like kipping escapes to mount yep. position, which uh, people see my students use in high level competition. Like, oh, what is going on there? Okay, so uh, we looked at some very advanced forms of escape you don't normally see so often. Um, and we started to add to this the idea of counter-attack, okay? Yep. If you look at Jiu-Jitsu Bernardo, you see it's kind of unique among combat sports insofar as it doesn't have a very well-developed sense of counter-attack. If, if you look at most martial arts, if you, if you look at karate, if you look at boxing, if you look at wrestling, 
they all have a very strongly developed sense of counterattack. You go into any wrestling class and you'll see a big emphasis put on what they call reshots. Where someone shoots at you, you block it, stuff it, and you yep. shoot right back and you count you use his offense to get into counter offense. Um, you'll see in boxing, someone throws a punch, you slip it, bang, you come back with your yep. own punch. Okay, so you're using their punch to set up your offense. So there's a strong sense of counter fighting. In Jiu Jitsu, we don't really have that. Uh, when you get in trouble, you're just expected to go back to neutral and be happy with that. And then from neutral, you work yeah. at a different angle. And they're probably and tired because yeah. you're... Uh, yeah. and we, don't, we don't really take advantage of our opponent's offense the yeah. way other martial arts do. So a big part of the squad philosophy is to change that, where we, instead of looking to go back to a neutral position like guard, our reasoning is very simple. There are a number of factors, some of them are physical and some of them are psychological, as to why you can greatly benefit your game instead of going back to a neutral position like guard to go directly to a submission hold. Um, I'm gonna, gonna outline this in terms of psychological principles, okay? Um, there's a theory which is often touted in uh, uh, basic psychology called the principle of sunk costs, and you see this a lot in business psychology, where you'll see that there's a, a broad principle across the spectrum where someone will invest a large amount of, say, money or time or effort into a given project. And if the project runs into trouble and more money or more effort or more time is required, they will be much more likely to put additional amounts of resources into the project, okay? So say, for example, I come to you, Bernardo, and I say, listen, man, I've got this project coming up, we've got a bunch of investors, I'd love it if you put $10,000 into the project. And you're like, okay, uh, I've known John a while and he seems reasonably honest. <laughs> He's wrong about that. Um, and, uh, uh, he, you know, let me give him $10,000. And then a month goes by and I show up in your office and I'm like, listen, Bernardo, project's not going so well. Um, we ran into some problems and uh, we're gonna need another $3,000 to get around this. And you're like, oh, that's, that's not good. You know, you, you told me it'd be $10,000 and I get a return within six months. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. But there's this problem. The, the city came in and we need new permits and the permits cost money, we've got to hire a lawyer and we need $3,000. And you're thinking to yourself, oh man, this, this is not what I wanted. I, I just wanted to get $10,000 and no more. But if I don't help, you've already put the money in, uh, and if I don't give money, he's, I'm gonna lose $10,000, I'll give him the $3,000. So you give me 3,000 more dollars. Six months later, I come in, I'm like, oh, Bernardo, we're, we're having a court case with the city, and uh, we're gonna need another $2,000 to pay the lawyers. And you're like, oh man, oh man. I, uh, but now you've given me $13,000, and if we don't, when you're gonna lose thirteen thousand yep. dollars, so you're more likely so to give me two thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This just goes on and on. And on. So we, as we give more and more, it's easier to get more and more yep. money out yep. of us. Yep. Now, interestingly, Bernardo, exactly the same thing happens in jujitsu, but instead of money, it's sweat. Okay, think about it. If I take someone down and I passed their guard and it was hard, the takedown didn't come easy. It was you know thirty seconds of brutal hard work. And then, boom, I put them down on the floor and it took me three minutes to pass their guard. It's hard. Now I'm breathing like crazy. There's only a few minutes left in the match. I work my way into the mounted position. And I'm like, whew, okay, I took him down. I passed his guard. I got to the mounted position. If I feel him starting to escape, what do, what do you think I'm going to do? I've sunk a lot of effort. Yeah, into I the match so far. Yeah. You think I'm going to give up that mouth easily? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I'm going to hold on for dear life, man. It's like, yeah. that cost me a lot of yeah, energy yeah, and sweat. I'm not giving that oh, up. Oh, that was a great analogy. Yeah, yeah. I love it. And so um, uh, I will tend, because of the principle of sunk cost, I will tend to overcompensate in the case of yep. uh, losing a pin. Okay? Yep. And that is where our second principle comes in. The first principle is psychological, is the principle of sunk cost. The second principle is the principle of extension. Plus, if I lie down, champ. If I get mounted on someone, Bernardo, as long as my body is contracted and short, I'm safe. Yep. Okay, it's hard for someone to submit me. But when my body gets extended and long, I become vulnerable. When I lose a pin, 
Okay, let's say I'm holding on to Placido like so, and I feel Placido go into, say, an elbow escape, for example. Okay, and I feel like his knees coming inside my knee, and I'm holding on, holding on, and I'm like, ah, I'm holding on like so. Okay, I don't want to lose the head, and I don't, I'm trying to squeeze my knees together, but I feel like I'm getting extended. And as Placido pushes back, my limbs start to extend. He brings a second knee inside, oh, second knee inside. Second knee, my right knee? Yep. On the other side. And from here, we come out, and there I'm getting extended, okay? Into a situation where I held on to the head too long, okay? I didn't want to lose the mounted position, and so I screwed up and I made a basic mistake. Here, I had control of the head. I lost on one side at the knee, and I tried to hold on to the head so I could recover, maybe get to half guard or what have you. I'm taking risks that I shouldn't be taking. As the second knee comes in, I'm overextended now. And now, bam, Udigatami. Okay? And I got punished because I held on too long. What I should have done is I should have just let go. Just as you should have done in the case with the money. Okay? Yep. When you heard me first come back, hey, Bernardo, I need more money, you should have been like, this guy's a scumbag. And you should have been like, just let me cut my losses and get the hell out of here. You would have lost $10,000 instead of $20,000. Okay? We should be doing the same oh, thing. That was a great okay? Um, we have to know when to cut our losses. Okay? Most people don't. Why? Because of the principle of sunk costs. Psychology yeah, works so against on. us. Okay? Yeah. You put so much effort in, you're reluctant to give it up. Okay? So you combine two things. The principle of sunk costs and the principle of extension. The principle of extension states that the more extended I become, the more vulnerable I become to submissions, okay? Um, there's a great boxer, Bernard Hopkins, who famously said a boxer is never more vulnerable than when he's throwing a punch, okay? If boxers in starts, it's hard to hit him. If he's yeah. locked in, he's well protected. But the minute he comes forward and extends, there's openings. Open and a good boxer, boom, can take advantage of this and drop him, okay? So ironically, the time when most people are most scared of a boxer when he's throwing a punch is actually one of the best times to be attacking. And exactly the same thing is true in Jiu-Jitsu, okay? As we get extended, just as a boxer gets extended and now he's open to being hit, a Jiu-Jitsu player gets extended, trying to hold on to a mounted position or a side position, That's you end up in trouble, side control. Here, I'm controlling Placido's hips and head, and he starts coming into a high leg escape. I'm holding on to the hips and the knees come in. Nope, nope, brings the knees in. And then from here, I'm holding on to the hips and it's like, oh no, I got extended. Okay, and as a result, I end up in trouble. Okay, and you see these kinds of things going on all the time. People try too hard to hold on to failing pins. Okay, they get extended, they get submitted. Guy's mounted on me. He's got his feet locked in tight. He's got a good position. And we start this action of bringing everything in close and then pumping the knees. And lo and behold, we find ourselves in a situation where he tried to hold on to my hips with his legs. And now he finds himself in a dreadful situation. If I feel him pushing into me, then from here it's not so hard for us to come around the corner and start locking up and putting this guy down into a winning position. Okay? Side control. We're in here. We're getting held down. We get good opportunities on here to slip everything in and catch. He goes to pull away from me in situations like this. It's not so hard for us to come around the court and start locking up and going into our counter offense. He got extended, tried to hold on to a pin longer than he should have held on to. Just as the investor made the mistake of falling prey to the principle of sunk costs and getting taken for more money than he should have. If we just no. realize, dude, okay, you made a bad investment, okay? Pull out. Minimize your losses, okay? We should be doing the same thing as you did. Most people don't. And so we have to take advantage of this by, uh, by going into this idea of counterattack from pins. It's my earnest belief, and this is the third principle that is a big part of this video series, the principle of equivalence. This is the idea that it takes an equivalent amount of energy to put an opponent in a submission hold as it does to put him in guard. That makes sense. That's very important, so I'm going to say it again. The amount of energy it takes to put someone back in guard from any pin is identical, and in some cases even less, than putting them in a submission hold. Okay? It doesn't take any extra energy for me to put someone in an ashigurami that does put them in guard. So for example, um, I'm side control block. From here, 
I'm able to work my way into an underhook and come up into the legs. As I come up into the legs, one potential finish here is a single leg, switching across to a double, right? He goes into a sprawl, it's hard, it's hard work. But if I just sit back and I can find myself in situations where I can release back into Ashigurami, now you're in submission territory. Good. Okay, he comes driving in on me here. And again, it's not so hard for us to start putting people down into winning position. Okay. Um, side control. From here, if I start putting my opponent back, I could just put him in guard, right? But why not just put him here in the clamp, make a strong body? Okay, from clamp position, it took me no extra energy than, than putting him in guard, but now I've got complete control of the head and one shoulder. We're just gonna set up transitions into submission holds. You can just put him back in guard position, we're directly to a submission, okay? And this is the philosophy that I want Jiu-Jitsu players to work with. It's a staple of the Jiu-Jitsu, uh, sorry, the squad approach to, uh, to, to escapes. Every time we come out of a pin, we're not looking to put him back in a neutral position. You want to go a step further? Go a step further, put him in a submission hold. Got it. If someone came to you and said it gave you a choice, Bernardo, would you rather get out of the mountain into guard position or out of the mountain to a submission hold? Uh, yeah, no, everyone of course you're gonna go. <laughs> yeah, but I think we are so automated. We are conditioned. Yeah, we are so conditioned yeah. to learn. Yeah. Get out and close the guard. Correct. Get out and... Now, how did this occur? It occurred because of tradition. Yeah. Okay. Jiu-Jitsu has a tradition which has inferior, neutral, superior. That position. makes completely sense. Okay? Yeah. And we all get programmed to go from inferior to neutral. Then when we're in a neutral position, we take a break. Okay, now I'm going to go for superior. Yeah. As opposed to straight from inferior, we get a tipping point in the pin where he's no longer effectively controlling us. And bam! Yeah. Straight into a submission, yeah. usually leg locks. Okay, but it doesn't have to be leg locks. Um, say, for example, guys mounted. I could hit a basic Kevin escape, and from here, instead of bringing one knee in for Ashigarami, we can bring two knees in. Now we've still got an overextended body, and as a result, we can go and yeah. upper body with Udigatami, and then from Udigatami, there's a mountain of other. Trials. Submissions we can go into. Okay. So it doesn't, you know, this is not only for people who like robots. It can be any kind of yeah. upper body or lower body submission. The principle is the same in every case. The idea is most people have what I call, what economists call, a satisficing approach to escapes. What does that mean? What does satisficing mean? It's a term thrown around in decision theory. The idea being that most people will go with a good enough outcome. Why go for a satisfying mindset when you can have a maximizing mindset? I agree. The only reason you should choose an inferior product over a superior one is price. That's it. Let's say there's two cars, okay? Um, one of them you like substantially more than the other, okay? You love the Mercedes and you're kind of indifferent about the Honda, okay? You, man, that Mercedes is beautiful. The Honda, yeah, it's good enough, you know. Um, the only reason you would choose the Honda is why? Because it's cheap. Yeah, good price. Okay, if they were the same price, you'd be an idiot yeah. to choose the Honda. Yeah. Okay, you go with the Mercedes. And this is true across the board. Same thing in Jiu Jitsu. You got two outcomes guard position or a submission hold. They cost you the same in yeah. terms of no, I agree, yeah. Why the hell would you choose yeah. neutral guard yeah. position? Yeah. If it costs you no more to put them in an Ashigarami heel hook or an Udigatami. I agree. Okay? It's only tradition which holds us in this direction. Now, that's not to say that there's times you don't use the traditional approach. I still use it. There's, there's days you're tired or you're injured and you, you just can't throw yourself into a, a submission hole or what have you. But literally 99 times out of 100, it's, it, it's just no, as I easy to take that route. Yeah, and I think like for the attacker, there's nothing worse in the world than getting a good position. <laughs> And the guy escapes, and I imagine like he escapes, put you yeah. in a bad position. So yeah, you did everything right. You, yeah. you came in, you took this guy yeah. down, you passed this guy, you got mounted, and now you're fighting your way out of a heel hook. It's like, yeah. are you yeah. fucking kidding me? Yeah, like, no, like, what is going on here? No, like, it's absolutely crushing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and my students when they were younger, and even more like assholes than they are now, um, <laughs> used to uh, use this on occasion. They would come out and just pull bottom mount. 
Okay. Their opponents were looking at like, are you kidding me? You're going to pull bottom out? They would get mounted and they would just heel hook him in 30 seconds. So, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's fascinating to see this kind of amalgam of psychological principles with physical principles. And uh, the idea is that most people go through their whole jiu-jitsu lives with a satisfying mindset. And what I want to do in this video is change people's perceptions and make them understand that you can bring in a maximizing mindset on a surprising number of occasions. Am I saying only use the maximizing mindset? Absolutely not. There's, as I said, there's plenty of times uh, when we use the, the, the satisfying approach. But why not augment it with this new, new, new approach, new philosophy, right. especially if it costs you nothing more, okay? Mm -hmm. And think about this now. Imagine two athletes fighting each other, okay? and they're very evenly matched. So that when athlete A makes an attack on athlete B and fails, athlete B comes back hard uh, a few minutes later with his own attack, and they attack each other one for one over the course of a 10 minute match, yep. okay? They get a certain number of submissions over the course of that match. What if one of those athletes, let's say athlete B, every time he got out of a submission hold, directly attacked the other guy? Yeah, no, then I, 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 at the end of the match, he would have twice the number of attacks as the yeah. other guy. Because he's not only attacking when he's on the attack, but he's attacking when the other guy's on the attack. And, uh, and right. what you find is very quickly when you adopt this approach, the number of submissions you attempt per 10 minute period doubles or triples. Yeah, I think even for the spectator, it's much it's, more exciting. It's much more exciting yeah. to watch. And, then yeah. you, 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 and you, I think, like, a perfect example of that is Gary Toller, yes. right? So, Fine example. Yeah, many times he doesn't even win the tournament, but in the end of the day, everybody's talking about the he, match that the he did. He, yeah. yeah, so yeah. I think, he, and also talking about him, I think he's the perfect example about the guy who escapes and connects the submission like yes. right away. And, and it's scary to fight against. Yeah. You feel like every time you do something good, you're getting punished by this. Yeah. Oh, Joe, and I'm so excited that you were teaching escapes now because every time I talk with Gordon and I ask him like why he's so confident about his jiu-jitsu and this and that, he doesn't mention his attacks. Yeah. He mentioned his escapes. He's yeah. like, man, I'm so confident that if I get in any spot, I can get out and put my opponent in a bad spot. That Why should I be scared about anybody? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, A big part of uh, my training program uh, comes down to psychology. This is something I've never really talked about in, in, in videos. That, um, people talk all the time about confidence, you know, and you yep. see like sports psychologists, yep. you know, they, they have their little methods of bringing yep. uh, uh, confidence to athletes. And I always kind of shrug my shoulders when I see this because in truth, the only thing which truly makes a jiu-jitsu player confident is, is the escapes. Why? Because if you truly believe in your heart of hearts, no one can pin you and no one can submit you. Yep. No, you'll either. take any risk you want, okay? Yep. Humans, by their very nature, are typically loss averse, okay? Yep. Losing something scares us more than the prospect of yep. fighting hard to win something. Yep. Um, when someone has gotten into the mounted position, they're afraid of losing it and will take risks to keep it. Yep. Risks that we can use to submit them. They get overextended. Yeah, okay, they're, they're, they're averse to loss. But in addition to loss aversion, most human beings have fear of risk. Okay, And what are the greatest risks in Jiu-Jitsu? The biggest risks are very simple, getting pinned and getting submitted. Okay, Submitted is the worst and pinned not far behind. Usually the two are linked. You can only get pinned and then submitted. So when we go out into a match and you're looking at the other guy and you're thinking like, how's this guy gonna beat me? It's gonna come down to his ability to pin you and submit you. That's what you're most worried about. But if you believe in your heart of hearts, there's not a human being on the planet that can pin you or submit you. Yep, no. You're gonna come out there and fire all of your oh. guns right at him. You're gonna take risks that most people wouldn't take. Oh. And you see this with Gary and Gordon. They just oh. They just believe no one can ever get a submission hold on them. And, you know, in the vast majority of cases, they're correct. And as a result, they just come out with guns blazing and take risks that most people shy away from. Uh, so, yeah, the psychology of building confidence, not by, you know, some kind of crazy visualization or meditation or any other crazy stuff like this, but rather by just hard physical training yeah. and escape skills until they just fully believe there's no one alive who's going to pin me or submit me. 
can't do, but they go out onto the stage. It's just shoo, 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 down yeah. Place. I think it would be also the same thing, John, if the guy is a boxer, but then he truly believes that the other one can't hit. punch his face. Yeah. So yeah. you. I mean, what makes you hold back from punching someone? The fear of getting hit. Yep. But if you believe this guy can never hit me, I'll be in a position or a stance where he can't hit me, dude, you'll throw punches all day. Yeah, no, I agree Same on thing with Jiu-Jitsu. And yeah. uh, so this has been the emphasis in the pin escape. So we're showing not just how to get out, but also, perhaps most importantly of all, how to turn every escape into an immediate counterattack. Yep. There's a heavy emphasis on uh, uh, going into immediate counterattacks. The basic division that we're making here, Bernardo, is that there are... Uh, five major pins in the sport of jiu-jitsu, side control, north-south, uh, knee on belly, mount and rear mount, and we're dividing them into leg-based pins and arm-based pins, okay? So for example, the mount would be a leg-based pin, why? Because his legs control my hips, okay? Side control, his legs have no contact with me. It's an arm-based pin, okay? And our basic intention is, in the case of arm-based pins, our first attacks should be into our training partner's arms, okay? Yep. In the case of leg-based pins, because his legs are around me, the most vulnerable point of his body will be his legs. And that should be our primary focus when we come out of these kinds of pins, okay? So our basic intention is arm-based pins, you come out and you attack the arms. Leg pace bends, you, you uh, come out and you attack the legs. Oh, John, and just yesterday, I, I asked you one question that fascinates me a lot. And was exactly about this. So I asked you, like, because uh, everybody talks about how you taught, like, 12 private lessons in one day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then mm -hmm. I asked, like, what, how were your private lessons? Because no, my, my first question was, like, Joe, how did you develop this scientist mind that you have? And then you said that it was in the private lessons, you would always row with the students and you didn't have the UK on every single private lesson. Yeah. And then you told me that the way you would row with your students in the private lessons was letting them start in the mode, in the side control, and you had to get out and connect on submission as quick yes. as possible. So that's pretty much this instruction, right? <laughs> yeah, it goes you... yeah, far back into my, into my teaching history. Yeah. Um, uh, I basically um, taught privates all day, every day um, for like a decade and a half. And uh, always, I, I, I was never a guy until my hip replacement uh, uh, finally ended this. I always did my privates with the student. I never yeah. had another person fill in work for yeah. me. It was always me working. And um, uh, as a result, I had an extraordinary amount of time uh, just feeling the positions, what was strong about them, what was weak about them. And when we did live rolling, which was every class, um, I would always start in positions of extreme disadvantage. And uh, it wouldn't be fair, uh, you know, like you can't go with a flu buck or a poop buck and you know, start neutral, you've got to yep. give them something to work with. And um, uh, I was able to map out numerous ways of going directly from very poor positions directly into submission counterattacks. And this kind of history in my teaching is reflected in this video. Yeah, no, that's amazing, John. And uh, Josephine, I was very, very impressed with like how many submissions you can find from these very bad spots. It's because quite shocking. I saw you doing like triangles, omoplata, the straight arm lock, heel hooks, leg locks. Uh, yes, that yes. was it's amazing quite to watch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you will see that there are patterns. Uh, they go in certain directions. There's a, there's a guiding philosophy, but there are many manifestations of those uh, of those guiding philosophies. And uh, there's, it's quite shocking. The first time you go against someone who exudes this kind oh. of spirit of always attacking you, you go with, with Gary Turner or Gordon the first time and they let you get mounted on them and then 10 seconds later, you're fighting for, for oh. your life out of a hill. Yeah, it's no, we, we, we were also yesterday on dinner just talking about like how dangerous might be to compete against someone like that. Because even if you're winning by 15-0 and you are on side control, you're on the mall, you can always get tapped. You, you can get you're like, and, Yeah, yeah. You never so, feel safe with yeah. someone like that. Yeah. You feel like you've done all this work, you're ahead by a, a comfortable margin and then suddenly you're but, tapping. And yeah, ultimately, okay. that's what counts. And if it costs you no more than just putting them back in guard, 
why not do it? Yeah, no, I agree 100. Yeah, so guys, if you guys uh, have been watching the Nogi scene lately, that's one thing that I think differentiates your guys from everybody else. That it's the level of escapes and level of connection to submissions from the escapes. Yeah. So, guys, the first instruction from the new Wave Jiu-Jitsu series is all about that, from positional That's situations, correct. right, John? Yes. Not from submission to yes. submission. The second video will be about going from submission, submission holds to submission. Into, yeah. yeah, so you're, you're counteracting, uh, uh, counterattacking, sorry, their submissions with your submissions. Yeah. And uh, basically, the, the whole idea is to generate, with new Wave Jiu-Jitsu, a generation of Jiu-Jitsu players who play a very attacking positive game of jiu-jitsu okay? yeah. um, in my time in jiu-jitsu i want as much as i can to remove that overly conservative element in jiu-jitsu where people do the minimum amount to win yeah i think it's fair to say but no one joined up at jiu-jitsu school with the uh the ambition of winning matches by advantage okay? Are you... no one on their first day in jiu-jitsu seminar I want to come in and learn how to win by advantage. Okay, that, that oh, has I no appeal to anyone. Okay, people came in because the magic of jujitsu is you get to control people and make them submit to you. I agree. That's honestly. the appeal. Yeah. And so my goal as a coach is to push the sport as far as I can in that direction, because the real magic of jujitsu is control that leads to submission. That's why all of us do it. That's why all of us are passionate about it. No one's passionate about by winning by the minimum amount possible. No, I agree. Now, in competitions, sometimes you got to do what you got to do, okay? Yeah. But it's not the goal. And uh, this kind of approach of always looking to uh, control leading to submission and the flip side of that, denying the other guy control over you yeah. and heading to submission, which yeah. is what this video is about, um, that's very, very dear to my heart. No, that's awesome. Yeah, so guys, uh, we're gonna launch it soon at bjfanatics.com. Maybe by the time you are watching, it's already there. So make sure to check that out. And I'm super excited to get back yeah. to the no gear yeah. again, John. I feel like we're getting yeah. the gang back together again. Probably. Yeah, so yeah. guys, just a recap here. So we had the Entering Assistant Series. That was the first one with John. That was all no gi. Then we went to the Go For It Faster right. with gi. That was more like fundamentals of gi. Then we went to Feet to Floor. That was standing with gi. And now we're back to no gear, yeah. So, but uh, this one will be substantially different because it's more concerned with the amalgamation of positional pressure with submission. I agree. Uh, into the system was just submission systems. Um, into the system was really a response to a very um, enthusiastic call in the grappling community for me to explain what my students were doing in EBI competition. Yep. Okay. Um, please bear in mind that EBI competition was quite a long time ago and uh, uh, the level of, uh, for example, leg locking expertise that was needed to win in those competitions wasn't as high as it is yep. today. So um, uh, Into the System did a great job of, of showing exactly what we did in those early days when the squad was young and first coming up through the ranks. But the mature aspect of the squad is manifested by great athletes like Gordon Ryan, Gary Tone, and Craig Jones, Nicky Ryan. Um, uh, coming up uh, in, a, in a time when the level of competition has substantially yep. increased in ADCC World Championship competition level uh, means that these videos go they're, they're a lot more sophisticated no I agree and, and uh, John I'm not like a, just try to lift you up but I really think that this cape is what differentiates them to yeah. everybody else because if you have this ability to believe so much in yourself that nobody's gonna tap you, nobody's gonna pin you, then you have the confidence yeah. to work yeah. on all the attacks that you have seen before. Yeah. And yeah, so guys, you're super excited about it. It's gonna be at bjjfanatics.com soon. Maybe by the time you're watching, it's already there. And thanks so much, John, Thank it was you. awesome. Great Thank you. you, thanks Placido. Thanks Placido, good to see you back. Please help me out to grow my YouTube channel. Just click subscribe. And to watch more videos, just click under see more videos. I hope you enjoyed. BJJFanatics.com. Use the promo code YouTubeFaria to get 10% off any instructional video. Improve your jujitsu faster.